very glad to welcome all of you to this very, very topical event. Um, I am Janet Winans, and I am the acting president of the League of Women Voters, and it gives me great pleasure to be able to uh, welcome all of you tonight, including our illustrious panel, and we do have three, and we're hoping the third will arrive. <laughs> but we will cover if not. As I welcome you tonight, I want to remind you of events and that are in our near future. First, the ballots for King County Proposition 1 should be arriving at your home at any time. Your vote will be very important in determining the funding of transportation infrastructure in the county. I know I don't have to encourage you to vote. I would assume that all of you are among our most loyal and careful voters. Second, we are watching the city council and the mayor's process in developing a ballot issue that will determine the funding of city parks. This is some, they expect it to be on the August primary ballot and we very much want, intend, to have an information forum dealing with the issues related to this method of funding parks, however, they turn, however it turns out that they present it. And we are forming a committee that will be doing research in that process that, that will also help the board of directors decide whether or not to endorse the issue. If this is something that is one of your passions, if you are interested in parks, and also the future of how we pay for things. I think that this is one of the most interesting things that's happening right now. How do we think we should pay for things that we have thought were paid for in the past? Um, and how can they be paid for in the future? because, um, and the city parks issue is most definitely that, a creative way to look at funding city parks. Also, we're going to be having probably on the August ballot or maybe in November, an, an issue dealing with um, preschool education. So again, if education and children is one of your passions, please be considering that you would be interested in volunteering to share in that committee work as we put together an information process that uh, gives the league the information we need to be a, to both decide how to endorse it and also to be effective in publicizing it to the community. Speaking of publicizing to the community, we are on TV. This is King County TV will be video taping us tonight. It will be available to see next week on their schedule. So if you'd like to re-see us or if you have friends that couldn't come tonight, please let them know that. Our annual meeting is going to be on May 15th. This is a very important business meeting for the league. It's the time that we do look back at what we have done over the past year and make decisions about how we are going to go forward. I think that Allison wants me to say there is a sign-up sheet in the back because this is something that is a dinner meeting and we very much would like to have reservations for that meeting. Um, it, and because of the 15th, we will not be having a forum on the first Thursday. So the, the May meeting of importance will be our annual meeting. No, that's not true. It's not our May meeting of importance. On the 28th of May, we are going to have a different kind of meeting of importance. We are organizing what we intend to be an annual gala breakfast to whom and to, we are inviting all of the candidates who will have registered 
to run in the August primary in King County to attend our breakfast on the 28th of May, 7.30 to 9 o'clock a.m. at the Weston Hotel. This is something that we <coughs> hope, excuse me, <coughs> that we hope and intend will be a major fundraiser, a major event that we look forward to each year. And this year, in our inaugural event, we are doing everything we can to make it be super easy when we do it next year. So all of your interest and support will be very helpful. Please invite your friends. And also please look for complete information. Okay, I'm, I'm reading what I should have said and I think I've, I've done that. I am excited to welcome all of you tonight because I believe that this forum stands in great example of the kind of public information outreach the League of Women Voters is dedicated to providing our community. The debate about the minimum wage has raged from the time of the New Deal. It is quiescent only during times until it is again, no, or, and it is taken for granted during those times. Only when things come together like they seem to be doing at this time, does it come into the kind of energy that we are seeing right now? Our Economics and Taxation Committee has been preparing for the, has been studying how to best present this to members of the League and the public. So our forum tonight has been a choice to have a hot topic forum, which means that we are ready to cover a really current issue. As you know, most many of our issues, we do a lengthy and very particular kind of study before we pres present it to the public. This minimum wage issue is running ahead of us. We do not have time to say that we will do a study and decide what our positions for this particular issue are right now. Instead, we want to be as informed as we can be and provide that information as currently as we can. I'm excited about this for reasons beyond the minimum wage. The principles of the League of Women Voters states that we believe that responsible government should maintain an equitable and flexible system of taxation, share in the solution of economic and social problems which affect the general welfare and promote a sound economy. If you read through the pages of our principles and positions, those of the U League of Women Voters US and Washington, as well as King County, you will find that we support governmental policies that provide for the welfare of our entire community and nation. As you listen to this, the discussion about the need for and the impact of raising the minimum wage, please consider this question. Just how should the League engage these very current questions about the minimum needs for quality of life and quality of commu community? From where should the money come to fund meeting those minimum needs? What role and responsibility does government have? What role and responsibility do those who consider themselves job providers have? So I'd like right now to introduce Jeanette Johnson, who is the committee chair, the organizer of this forum, and she will then introduce our speakers for tonight. Welcome everyone to our April forum entitled Minimum Wage, Living Wage. We have three 
Uh, well, we have two speakers, one on the way, I'm sure, <laughs> um, that uh, I will introduce in just a few moments. But first, I want to provide an overview of what our agenda is for the meeting. And you all have agendas on your chairs. Um, our three speakers will uh, speak about 15 or so minutes. And then um, we will have a uh, period of one half hour for questions at the end. At the end, if you have a question, there are little cards on your uh, chairs. Write your questions down. We have a couple of uh, monitors who will pick them up and uh, deliver them to Laura down here who will gather them all together. Now to introduce you to our speakers. First of all is Diana Pierce. Diana is widely recognized for coining the phrase, the feminization of poverty. She received her PhD in sociology and social work from the University of Michigan and taught at the University of Illinois. She's been awarded three Fulbright scholarships in Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan, and she has testified before Congress and the President's Working Group on Welfare Reform. Most important for our discussion tonight, she has created what she calls the self-sufficiency standard, which is one measure of what it costs for someone living in an urban area to provide for themselves without having to rely upon some federal program. Next, we have, well, you know, I'm gonna skip David for now. <laughs> I'm, gonna go to, I'm gonna go to Howard Wright. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wright is founder and CEO of Seattle Hospitality Group with hotel, restaurant, travel, and tourism operations in California, Hawaii, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, and Alberta. He is a partner in the Space Needle Corporation and many, many other things. Uh, but what he's here tonight to talk to us about, he it has been appointed by the mayor as co-chair of the uh, Citizens 2A Seek Committee, is that what you call it? I, 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 Income and Equality. Okay, Income and Equality <laughs> Advisory Committee. So I guess I will talk a little bit about, change my mind, I will talk a little bit about David Rolfe, who is not here yet, but I'm, I'm assuming will be. He is known nationally as an innovative labor leader, president of SEIU Healthcare 775 Northwest, which is the fastest growing union in the Northwest, representing 43,000 home care and nursing home workers in Washington State and Montana. And he is also, along with Howard, chairing the mayor's IIAC committee. I urge you to read more about these distinguished people. I'm, I'm very impressed. Um, they're in your agenda and I didn't wanna cover it all, so we have to have some surprises for <laughs> la later on reading. So at the outset, I would like to introduce Diana Pierce, who will talk about the self-sufficiency standard and what it tells us about the minimum wage. Good evening, thank you very much. What a wonderful introduction. Uh, and I uh, hope I can live up, live up to that. Uh, I haven't done this before where I can't see what I'm <laughs> talking about. So, so if, I, if I keep on talking to the screen, just somebody wave at me and say, talk to us, please. 
So I'm going to talk about three things uh, today. I'm going to talk, the, this is what I was asked to do, um, about the federal poverty level and why the poverty line underestimates um, not only the cost of living, but even what we mean by poverty. Um, I'm going to talk about the self-sufficiency standard and what it tells us about the cost of living um, in King County. And I'm going to talk about what it means when you're below self-sufficiency, what kind of choices it means, what kinds of um, help that you need to get and that, peop uh, that people get, what it means, in other words, to, uh, what a $15 an hour or $12 an hour wage really means in terms of what it will meet for families' needs. We, uh, why we have the self-sufficiency standard? We all know what we mean by poverty. It means not being able to meet your basic needs. Uh, but what we measure isn't uh, what uh, is very different than what we mean by uh, poverty. That wasn't always true. Uh, the federal poverty measure is now broken. I thought I'd give you a little bit of visual <laughs> um, <laughs> simulation here. We need a standard of income adequacy, um, one that actually runs. If you look closely in this picture, there's actually <laughs> so this is what has happened to the federal poverty line. Um, the white line is, uh, is median income and how that has gone up over time. And the black line is the federal poverty line, which has only been updated for inflation. And we may want to talk later about what kind of inflation or uh, index you use because obviously using inflation doesn't keep up with changing standards of uh, living. So when it starts here, it's about 50 percent. Now it's less than 30 percent of median in, in, uh, less than 30 percent of median income, um, and that makes a big difference. It covers a lot less of people's um, expenses than it once did. So the self-sufficiency standard uh, developed it to measure the cost of a basic needs budget varies by where you live and um, by your family type. And it's the amount of income uh, required to meet your basic needs without any kind of informal uh, subsidies or public subsidies at a minimally um, adequate level. So public subsidies like food stamps, it doesn't include those at all. And, it doesn't, and private subsidies, things like shared housing or low cost or free babysitting from, uh, by a, a relative. Um, this is a really a bare bones budget. <laughs> <laughs> so you have on your chairs a little, um, a green uh, sheet of paper. Uh, so I thought it would be fun for you to have a little bit of something to take home. Uh, I should get one for you. <laughs> uh, and sort of th look at that and think about what are the costs of these, di th uh, these different things. Um, and I've given my, my co-conspirator here, Nancy Amade, the answers. So if you want later to get answers <laughs> of what these costs actually are for King County, I'll be giving you some, some of them up here. Um, but as you think about it, these are the, these are the costs that are um, that and it is a really bare bones budget. As you'll see on the back with the assumptions, the food, food budget is groceries only. There's not a takeout, uh, uh, there's no pizza, there's no latte, uh, it's really bare bones. Transportation is public transportation because in Seattle and King County we have adequate public transportation. You know, there's a lot of issues, but it's adequate enough for people to get to and from work. We get made the most conservative, this is the minimum amount. The amount for housing and child care isn't what you or I would set. We would be too generous, probably. <laughs> um, this is the fair market rents, which is what people getting housing assistance get. And that housing cost includes, um, includes uh, utilities as well. The child care is the rate at which people getting child care assistance from the state get help from the state. So it's what the state says is adequate, is minimally adequate to, to, to meet the need uh, for, uh, for child care. So this is not luxurious. It may not be what your children or grandchildren pay, uh, pay for uh, 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 child care. It's the minimum we need. Uh, same thing with health care, transportation, it's the minimum. And then we calculate taxes and, and tax credits. These are, this is what we'll, we will hand out. You can't read it, but uh, for example, for two adults with two children, 
um, we allow $1,179 for um, a two-bedroom uh, housing unit for an apartment, for two bedroom, including utilities. Now think about it, what kind of housing you can get for that. So this is a really bare bones budget. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. She's, so Nancy's handing out the net answer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So this is to give a sense of not, not the whole number, like $15 an hour. This is like how this breaks down to w what people need on a, on a monthly basis. So what happens when people don't make, aren't able to make ends meet, and they don't meet the, these wages, depending upon their family type and where they live, how much money they would need? Basically, workers with inadequate income have three choices. Excuse my kind of amateur clip art, but at least it's visually a little interesting. Um, so first of all, don't do without altogether. So you don't go to the doctor. You don't even go to the, even to the emergency room because everything costs, costs money. You just do without. Um, you don't go to the dentist. And your kids don't go to the dentist. And you can see what that means at, you know, over time. <clears throat> or a second choice is to use substandard um, services or products, uh, such as doubled up housing. Um, inadequate child care providers. You get along with what you can pay for. This is what I can afford. This is what, what I end up doing. And doubling up on housing is, you know, that's one of the biggest single costs, and you can't pay part of your rent, so doubling up is one way to deal with it. And a third, when those don't work, is, um, is they get assistance. And most people start with their family and friends, then they turn to the community, like the church, um, and finally, they'll, they'll go to public assistance. That's a food stamps um, uh, card, yeah, an electronic benefit card. So that's what, that, those are the kinds of choices that people, uh, people have to make. This is a lot of dense numbers here. Um, but a single parent, their preschooler and a school-age child needs over $4,700 a month to meet her needs. This bare bones budget, $27 an hour. At minimum wage, she only earns a little more than a third of that. And she qualifies for just about every kind of assistance, although very few people get, especially housing assistance, get all kinds of assistance. At $12 an hour, she's up to 45% of her needs, still far from it, and she still qualifies for childcare, housing, healthcare, and food stamps. And even at $15 an hour, when her salary meets more than half of her needs, she still qualifies for housing, childcare, and food stamps. Now, when you look at these budgets, you can see that if you have, you know, half of that, you need, you need some help, and you do qualify for some help. Uh, the eligibility levels, um, put another way, a family's eligible for assistance well above poverty. So the, this line here is the poverty line. This is double poverty, and that's 300% of poverty. So the standard is up here, is that dashed line is near the top. Um, this is where your net income for a basic food, for food stamps is, uh, and the 200% uh, is the gross income, and uh, Apple Health for Kids, so getting chips uh, <coughs> for them. We have to, women, infants, and children, it's another nutrition program. This is child care assistance. So this is what you actually need. You get help up to this point. Uh, you can see we have... We do have some problems in terms of people, there being a gap between them, but those are well, well, well above the, the, poverty, uh, uh, the poverty line. Uh, finally, I wanted to add one other piece to this, just in case you're not enough depressed, um, <laughs> um, is this is a moving target. Income inequality continues to increase in, the United, in Washington state at a higher rate than in the United States. And I've got some more, but I'll just show you a couple things here. So just in the last three years, 2009 to 2012, we don't have numbers on this for 2013 yet, the top 1% versus the remaining 99%. So in the US, the top 1% got 95% of all the income increase coming out of the recession. Because the recession supposedly ended in 2009, and we're, you know, we're, in, we're in recovery, decreasing unemployment, et cetera. 
So they got 95%, the top 1% got 95%. In Washington State, the top 1% got 100%. Of all the increase between 2009 and 2012 in this state went to the top 1%. So we're looking at a moving target. Income inequality is not only problematic, it's getting worse every day. It's you know, baked in now to the way our economy is, is working, unless we might make some changes. And here's another way to look at what this means. Um, this is the last 10 years. These figures, by the way, that I'm giving you are for 2011. Um, the the uh, Seattle King County Workforce Council is the one who updates it, and they're updating it this year. They haven't gotten to it yet, so <laughs> um, hopefully we'll get that project going and we'll have it uh, in a few months. Uh, statewide median earnings over the last decade, 2001 to 2011, went up 21%. And in the same time period, the standard went up 37%. Uh, and what I didn't put up here, um, which we may want to talk about more, is that it went up more than inflation, quite a bit more than infl in inflation. That even if you indexed, if we just took the self-sufficiency standard in 2001 and increased it by inflation, it would not go up 37 percent. I can't remember what the exact percentage is. Um, but the cost of living goes up more. Just like when I showed you originally the federal poverty line, that goes up with the CPI, with the cost of living. Um, and that doesn't keep up with the changing real cost of living for people at this level. So the basic needs like housing, childcare, food, transportation are going up faster than the overall CPI. Um, and that's what the self-sufficiency standard uh, tells us. Believe me, it would be, be so much easier if I calculated it once and then just use the CPI to update it. But in every state and every city I've done this, it goes, it's going up faster than, um, than, the C, than the CPI for that area, for that time. So uh, just so places where to find, um, where to find resources, um, selfsufficiencystandard.org, that's easy to remember. If you want to go online and figure out what the standard is for your family or a particular family and what kind of benefits they qualify for, there's, there's a website. It's called thecalculator.org. Sorry, this, I forgot to check. It doesn't show up here. Um, thecalculator.org. It's very easy. And if you want to get in contact with me by email, Pierce, my last name, if you just spell it right, at uw.edu. So I think we'll, I will stop at that point. <laughs> I would like to introduce to you now David Rolf. David, we've already said some very nice things about you. <laughs> Thank you for that. You don't have to, you don't have to repeat them. <laughs> so anyway, I will just say that uh, David uh, chairs or co-chairs the uh, Income Inequality Committee with Howard. And he will be here to speak to us on what the committee's doing, particularly with respect to the union perspective. So, um, David, you are on. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for this wonderfully packed audience tonight. And thanks, everyone, for coming out. The, you really want me at the podium? You don't want me here? Okay. You're, they're on TV. You're on TV. Oh, I'm on TV. Okay. <laughs> Well, th thank you everybody for coming out tonight and I appreciate that it's a full house tonight and um, it's an important topic. I, you know, I feel like much of the presentation I often give on this topic was actually just done by Diana <laughs> uh, with lots of facts Sorry and statistics about, about income inequality, the cost of living, um, about what has happened to spending power for ordinary Americans. And I want to get to the work that I think is very important that we're doing on the Mayor's Income Inequality Committee. But just for a moment, I'd like people to think back into history only a few years. Um, only a few years. Uh, I like to, I, was, I remember as a boy celebrating our nation's bicentennial and uh, lots of patriotism and American flags and fireworks to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the United States. And what I love about our country so much is that it keeps getting better. 
that we were hardly born in perfection uh, as a nation. We had slavery, we had smallpox, we had short license expectancy, only property owning white men could vote. But we had this dream about liberty and justice for all. And for 200 years, we passed along more liberty and more justice, always through struggle, to the next generation. And it was actually true that when parents looked their kids in the eye and said, if you worked really hard and you play by the rules, you're going to have it better than I had it. And that was a true statement from every parent to every child for 200 years of our nation's history. Uh, in 1976, there were two guys running for president, Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter. Now, imagine if one of them had given a speech that went something like this. My fellow Americans, uh, we're going to get through this tough decade. We're going to heal the wounds left over by war and scandal our nation's Oval Office. We're going to see the end of double-digit inflation and unemployment. No more lines for gasoline, no more oil boycotts. In fact, we're going to see the Berlin Wall fall and the end of uh, communism and uh, no more foreign military threats to U.S. soil. And it gets even better than that. We're going to see legal barriers to participation in the workforce for women and minorities crumble. We are going to invent new industries on our soil, which will create more wealth in the next 30 years than have been created in all of humankind up to now. It would have been an incredible speech. And it would have all been true. But what if the speech had gone on? 93% of that wealth is going to go to the top 1% of income earning Americans. 7% to the top 10%. None of it to the bottom 90%. The bottom 50% are, in fact, going to have to take a pay cut. We're going to eliminate pensions in the private sector. We're going to transfer health care costs on the consumer. We're going to shred the funding for urban and rural public schools. We're going to make debt-free college education a mythological creature from our past. We are going to offshore manufacturing, import third world wages, privatize, globalize, deregulate, deunionize, detax. And the same family that right now needs a single salary to afford a modest home uh, the basic necessities of life, and maybe even a trip to Yellowstone or Disneyland once a year with the kids in the back of the station wagon is going to need at least three incomes to live the same quality, quality of life. In fact, the net economic impact of women doubling their workforce participation between 1977 and 2012 will be zero dollars in real take-home pay for the bottom 90 percent of income earning families. Whoever gave that speech would have also been telling the truth. And he would not have won the presidency <laughs> because no one would have voted for that vision. That is, however, the vision we have gotten. Um, and it's not because we lack wealth. Uh, we are, in fact, we remain the largest and wealthiest economy in the country. It's not because we lack productivity. American workers are now more productive than they ever have been. It is not uh, because of uh, decades of reckless social spending have somehow bankrupted us and left a, a, a legacy of debt to our children, uh, and it's not because um, people, the companies aren't doing well, CEOs and investors aren't doing well. But if you think about this idea of growth, economic growth, for all of our history as a country up till the early 1970s, it meant several things at once. It meant the overall economy, GDP, was growing. It meant that capital markets, the stock market, bond markets were growing. It meant that corporate profits were growing. It meant that employment was growing, and it meant that wages were growing. All boats were rising together. And then sometime in the 1970s, something broke down. And starting in 1980, we've had wageless growth in the United States. No net new spending power for most workers. Um, for some, a decline. Uh, then since 2000, we've had jobless growth. No net new jobs created in the American economy uh, in this millennium. And all of this in the context of the most phenomenal accumulation of wealth in world history. It is no longer true. Last year, two years ago, I was giving a speech to say we're, more, we're as unequal as we were right before the Great Depression. That's now a lie. We are more unequal than we were right before the Great Depression, more unequal than at any time in the 20th century. So this is why uh, I believe the work of this, uh, of this committee and the work that we have begun here in Seattle is so important. You know, uh, a year, almost a year ago, we saw the beginnings of the fast food workers movement here and around the country with strikes to protest low wages at fast food restaurants. We saw uh, the initiative at SeaTac, and uh, you know, after many, many years of incredible frustration at seeing what were middle class jobs become low wage jobs, workers in SeaTac taking matters into their own hands and raising wages directly through access to the ballot. 
Um, we all experienced around the country the Occupy movement a few years ago. It, it didn't have many long-term strategies for sustaining itself, but it raised a very important issue, which was the issue of inequality. And, you know, the minimum wage is not often thought of as a dramatic, bold, significant tool for addressing inequality precisely because federal minimum wage increases have always been so small or in, within living memory. That wasn't true always back in the 40s and 50s, but it has been true for decades. They've been very incremental. They have impacted a relatively small number of workers working in a relatively small number of firms. And in 43 states, restaurant employees are exempt from increases in the federal minimum wage. So uh, when I talked to a U.S. Senator recently and she said, you know, I, people just aren't calling my office a lot about this federal minimum wage bill. Well, I'm not surprised because the difference between $9.32 and $10.10 isn't that bold or inspiring. And I always, you know, remind people that the Civil Rights Movement was not about desegregating lunch calendars, lunch counters only on Tuesdays. That the move for a $15 minimum wage is a bold, moral, aspirational, and visionary claim. It's not attempting to uh, adjust the needle a little bit in the face of this 40-year trend towards dramatic inequality. It's actually people standing up and saying, we're actually tired of CEOs waiting for CEOs. We're tired of waiting for Congress. There are local and state options for doing this for ourselves, and it actually benefits everybody. Uh, there is, there's fear that this is going to have a terrible impact on small business. Well, you look at the, seven, at, the, at the 10 states or municipalities that have gone ahead and raised the minimum wage. That is the fear, but it actually hasn't been borne out in the data. Uh, San Francisco raised the minimum wage to 30% over the California standard. Restaurant employment grew. Uh, Santa Fe raised their minimum wage to 65% over their state standard. No negative impact on employment. Um, but what is clear that if states, it's very clear to me, the federal government is not acting on this problem anytime soon. And what is very clear to me that if states and localities don't act like the laboratories of democracy they were in fact intended to be, that this problem will be with us for a long time. Uh, consider that in 2009, the depths of the recession, 24%, shamefully, 24% of all jobs in this country were low wage jobs, jobs paying under 15000 or under $15 an hour or under $30,000 a year. At the current rate of growth, 48% of all jobs will be low wage jobs by the end of this decade. A doubling of the percentage of jobs that are low wage from 2009 to 2020. Right? And this has profound implications for everybody. Workers without money are exceedingly bad customers. If you sell things, goods or services, whether you run a hardware store, a therapy practice, a doctor's office, work in a pharmacy, uh, deliver pizzas, you are going to have less stuff to sell and make and deliver and fewer services to provide as your customers have less money to spend. If you're in the government and you count on a robust middle class to generate tax base through sales and property taxes, uh, look again because uh, sales tax collections and property tax collections are unlikely to go up uh, for people whose incomes are going down and chances to own property are also decreasing. Uh, when you look at the uh, rate of job growth in individual categories, you find, you know, we hear a lot about, well, if we just had more education, everyone would have a high pay, high skill job of the future. B far be it for me to say anything but fantastic things about the power of education to be transformative in individuals' lives. But in the aggregate, if 17 of the fastest 20 growing jobs require only a high school education, it's just a lie. But that's, in fact, what we see. So what do we do about it? Um, the minimum wage is not designed to cure all ills. We have many, many things that we have to do, I believe, to uh, address income inequality. Some of that has to do with tax policy. Some of it, in fact, has to do with education. Some of it has to do with infrastructure investment. Some of it has to do with access to capital and credit. Um, but fundamentally, it cannot be addressed if we don't address the decline in wage earning powers for American households. Uh, there is a, a famous economist at Princeton University who chaired the President Obama's first Council of Economic Advisors. I heard, was at a conference with him last year, and he said, uh, we've, studied minim we've studied low wage employment a lot. And one thing we can determine with certainty that all low wage jobs have in common is that they aren't being paid very much by their employers. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> this may be a complex political uh, path to walk down. It's not a complex problem to understand. We've seen plummeting wages in the era of rapid economic growth. 
And someone, a, an author that I like a lot, Douglas Rushkoff, who's sort of a futurist, went to speak to Occupy New York when they were occupying Zuccotti Park. And he said, we're not asking for income redistribution. We're just asking for the income redistribution to stop. Because that's, in fact, what we've seen over the last 40 years. So a couple words about this commission. The mayor asked Howard, Wright, and I, and me to chair this commission. I don't think either of us understood that we were signing up for an additional full-time job of <laughs> 35 to 40 hours a week of work uh, as volunteers. Uh, chairing this commission for four months and trying to deliver a, a, a consensus or strong majority report to the mayor by the end of the month. The mayor has said uh, that he wants to get to 15. He has said he is open about how we do that, that there's lots of things to be worked out, and that he wants this commission to work it out. We've now had five or six, six full meetings. We have three more to go. We've had four to five subcommittees that have worked on specific tasks or outreach things. And then the all of us on the committee are probably putting in a few dozen hours a, a week just in terms of outreach and communications with various constituencies that have something to say about this subject. We uh, conducted a, two academic analyses, one at the one University of Washington analysis about a portrait of who low-wage workers are in Seattle, another by the University of California, Berkeley, that looked at the impact of other living and minimum wage initiatives around the country. Uh, we held a day-long symposium. Uh, a night-long town hall public testimony meeting, and we are now at the point where we are actually in the roll up your sleeves, get this negotiated, get it done phase. I think the good news is, without giving it, you know, all the details away, there's actually consensus around a lot of things. Um, and some of the things that we thought might have been the most contentious are actually either s sort of more or less agreed to or more or less not on the table at all. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised that a uh, Trotskyist and a disciple of Ayn Rand were able to agree on the principle of not having exemptions from a minimum wage law. Um, that was not intuitive to me that that was going to happen, but it nevertheless <laughs> did. Um, and so uh, we, I think we're on a path. We have, I would say, one or two very thorny, very difficult issues to negotiate out over the next three weeks. Um, and then we enter the next phase of this, which is when the mayor takes what we've done, hands it off to the council, and we are off the races again for another two months of hearings and debate. So uh, that's really, I think, what I had to say. And I hope you will wish us luck, because this has been a uh, not easy task. Uh, the goal is uh, the right goal. And the devil is, as always, in the details and in really trying to find the space for collaboration and compromise within a you know, 25 member committee without any caucuses or political parties uh, where every vote is going to count. So thank you all very much, and later on I'll be happy to take some questions. Thank you, David. And now we have Howard. Well, I think I'm going to reverse. I'm going to start reversing the alphabet because I always follow David, and I never know how to follow such a great speech. It's a pleasure <laughs> to have such a great, well-informed colleague. And I'd like to thank Jeanette and Janet tonight. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters. I'd like to thank the homemade cookie maker, whoever you are. <laughs> Can't wait to come back. I'll talk on anything. I don't even know if I know about it, but I'll come back for that. But thanks so much. I also want to tease my friend and colleague David, and that is, is that I only wish I were his age at the Bicentennial, because it would have meant I was in my crib to watch the Bicentennial. <laughs> not, not, not quite. I was in school. <laughs> Good. So um, I learned a, I've learned a couple lessons about uh, being on this uh, Income Inequality Advisory Committee, and that is that um, when uh, the, the now mayor was running for office against the incumbent. I, I'm not politically involved. I'm, I'm civically aware, and I vote in every election. But other than that, that's about the limit of my political involvement. And, but I did go to a few fundraisers, and I did go to a few public forums. And I guess I asked the question one too many times, how do you stand on the $15 minimum wage down at SeaTac? Because now I'm co-chairing the <laughs> mayor's committee. So be careful how many times you go to a public forum and, and, and ask the question. We are a committee of 24, 
roughly made up of eight people from the employer business side, eight people from labor, and uh, eight people from the not-for-profit uh, community here in Seattle. And I'm here on the committee because I do believe in a $15 minimum wage. Um, I do think it's the right thing. I think it's the right goal. I think it's the right outcome. And I look forward to being a proud citizen of a city that pays that. I want to see it done in the right way. Um, and it's wonderful to be on a committee that is mostly united in that goal and in that outcome. We may have different opinions on how we get there and over the period of time how long it takes to get there, but we will get there and it will impact and benefit many, many people in our community. And as David said, the mayor recognizes this as one solution to the challenges facing our community. So this will not be the cure-all to end all. It, we're addressing wages and other people will have the honor and the distinction of serving on committees to address health care, housing, transportation, as you mentioned, is coming up on the ballot, uh, job growth, education, and training, all important things to our city. The country, if not the world, is watching Seattle on this minimum wage issue, and this is why it's so important that we do it right. As the mayor said, and I quote him, this will be hard. There certainly will be blood on the floor. I will be an honest broker. No deals have been pre-negotiated by anybody. And if we can't get a model that's useful to the rest of the country, we have not succeeded. And that's why we're working so hard. Um, when I got home after my first meeting, I said to my wife, I, I didn't realize I had 20 hours a week to devote to this. And she said, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking forward to a successful outcome to this. When I mention the 24, I also want to include, of course, three council members, city council members who are on the committee with us. So council member Bruce Harrell, uh, Nick Licata, and councilwoman Sawant, who was just elected in, in November. We have, um, we are getting down to the short strokes uh, of this. As David said, it's a four month charge. It is, um, we are in our final month of April. I do expect that we will finish on time and that we will have a report to recommend to the mayor and the mayor will then recommend, hopefully recommend what we recommend up to the city council. They'll debate it, hopefully pass something that's mostly acceptable, as I like to say, mostly acceptable to most of the people and, um, and then sign it uh, into law. I believe it's the right thing to do. I know that, uh, as we all have heard, uh, the maxim about housing, you pay for your own housing, whether it's an apartment or a mortgage or something in between, sort of the rule is about 30% of your income should go to housing. And if 30% of your income goes to housing in this town, to rent a studio apartment takes a minimum wage for, uh, for $15 an hour to rent a studio apartment for one person and most people are providing housing for more than one person. That's why this is so important to do. There are many other cities who have passed this uh, minimum wage law um, at different rates, and we wanna make sure that we've learned their lessons. We certainly have met with them, we've talked to them, we've invited them up to Seattle. We had a symposium at Seattle University last Thursday, had a town hall meeting uh, earlier in the month. There's been a great deal of input, a great deal of research, great contributors like Dr. Pierce, who have informed us and educated us on how to go about this and how to do it right. Um, it, I was asked before when we were talking just uh, before this started, what surprises have I learned? Uh, one surprise to me is how mostly unified most of the business community is in support of this goal. And I think that's unique about Seattle. I can think of many, many communities where there would be, you know, hell no, excuse me, but hell no, not on my watch. And, um, but uh, that's what we're seeing here in Seattle. Um, most people have said, you know, if we're gonna do it, uh, obviously everybody has said, if we're gonna do it, let's do it the right way. And um, I know there are people here in the community, I, I, I know there are people here in the room tonight, certainly people watching on television that believe that it should be instantaneous, if you will, or it should be soon after it's passed law as it was in SeaTac, you know, the election was last November and it went into effect January 1. 
Um, I'm on record as saying that I support $15 and I support it coming, uh, but I don't support it right overnight. And that is because I do think that it will be damaging to business and I do think it'll be damaging to employees. Not an, that's, not, that's not a popular opinion with many people, but I think that when companies and employers and social service agencies who have contracts that go out into the future, it's really, really hard to change your cost basis in what would it be about a seven week period, I think. There's everybody from people in my business, I'm in the tourism and hospitality business, who already have their rate cards printed for the year, you know, for the new year coming for 2015, that would be. There are people who have contracts. There are social service agencies who receive public funding from either the city, the county, the state, or the feds. And so their costs are baked into what their grants are. So instantly, I have a difficult time supporting that. I respect everyone's entitled to their own opinion for those who want 15 now, but um, that's not where I'm, that's not my position, and I'm speaking from my personal position. David and I have been remarkably disciplined uh, in our neutrality of working as the co-chairs of this. It is amazing, so 24 less the two of us is 22 less the three council people is 19, and um, there are 19 very strong type A personalities <laughs> <laughs> on this committee. So it's been a huge learning, steep learning curve for me. It's been wonderfully stimulating. I've learned a great deal. I'm honored and humbled to be in this position uh, co-chairing, and I think that's, uh, that's all that I have to report. And I think it's Q&A that starts in a minute, and we'll look forward to hearing from everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Howard. Yeah, over uh, to Laura. We're accepting your cards for questions. Just raise your, write your question on your card, and um, someone will pick it up and uh, take it to Laura. We have a couple of questions already written up. This is for David and Howard. Do you think total compensation, such as medical benefits, sick leave, et cetera, should be considered in the $15 limit? Well, I think the subject matter is, going to, is already under consideration by the committee. Um, and as Howard said, we have been both very disciplined about not taking out not taking very, other than saying I think both of us want to get to 15, and otherwise the mayor probably wouldn't have put us on this, um, we've not, we've avoided getting into specific commitments on outcomes. I think there's, you know, it's not surprising to say that there are roughly equal numbers of people on the committee who are very interested in that idea, as there are people who are very opposed to that idea. And there are arguments, you know, good arguments being made in, in, in both ways. Um, I think that there are a number of specific topics on that, I mean, this in this sort of bucket of quote-unquote total compensation, you know, there's a wide variety of things you could talk about. Uh, I think the, the issues of interest, of the highest level of interest on some part, some members of the committee are health care, tips, commissions, bonuses, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff that is not receiving, that we did not really rise to the top of people's priority list. Um, but there's also a strong view, uh, you know, by many that those are problematic and that a wage is a wage and has a specific definition. So uh, where we end up on this, I am not willing to predict, and if I uh, could, I probably wouldn't, but um, that would take all the fun out of the next three weeks. Uh, but it's definitely, a, I would say, if, if there is a single issue under the most robust debate and discussion of the committee, it is that issue. I agree. Um, there are people on the committee who are uh, strict interpretationists of the state minimum wage, and there are people who are talking about what helps pay the rent. There are other people who recognize that, uh, in, in my company, for example, our employees have uh, free ORCA cards for transportation, and we pay educational reimbursement, things like that. As an employer, I want to be really careful, especially because this is being publicly recorded, I want to be careful what I say. As an employer, would I like to see that counted? Yeah, of course I would, but do I think it's realistic? No, not in the least bit. 
I don't think that those benefits, which I'm proud that we provide, I don't think those benefits that I named help pay the rent. That's a very sticky subject. Um, Diana, you mentioned the state assistance up there for housing. When the state figures the, the assistance, do they look at the cost of living of various urban areas, or is it all just one, you know, one consideration for the whole state? Uh, well, you mentioned the fair market rents in two, yeah. two con contexts. One of them was that we use that as the cost level in the standard, and that varies by urban area, and then we vary it we use data to break that down within the uh, within the urban area. So if it's a multi-county ur urban area, we do it for each county. Uh, on the other side, in terms of assistance, uh, again, the fair market rents are by er by um, okay. metro areas and then um, by rural counties. Usually, groups of rural counties because the data is not enough to break it down by every county. But it is it is broken down. It's not statewide. Here's another question. Um, what happens to people who are now making $15 an hour? In other words, what do you think the snowball effect might have, particularly on small businesses? And I guess I'll open it to the whole panel. Um, th there's some data on this. Um, it's not usually called snowball. It's usually called spillover effects, um, which is the idea that if you've got one person working at 15 and someone at 14 and the 14 gets raised to 15, this person's gonna be unhappy because you know, they're, they're the same, so this person's will be raised, but usually not by 100% of the raise that went from 14 to 15. And that d drops off really fast, um, so I think it's like 65 or 70 percent, I'm sorry, I don't have exact numbers, for the, you know, like for about 10 percent above the minimum wage, and then it goes down to um, about 10 percent when you get to twice the minimum wage. So it's a fairly fast drop off. So at twice the minimum wage, when you raise the minimum wage, the people at twice the minimum wage, their wages may go up about 10 percent. And then it, you know, it's it's more as you get closer to it. So you you get a you get a bump up effect, but you also get a compressing of the of the wage inequality. Okay. Is that? I, I don't have any. She has the data, so let's <laughs> listen to her. Okay. <laughs> I can say anything. <laughs> well, I, I th you know, it's a great question. Um, and whatever we, whatever the final report is, or whatever the final law is, is it's not going to solve and fix everything. There will be what are called unintended consequences. And I, I hate to use that and just sort of toss it away and then I get to walk out of the room and go home tonight because it doesn't solve some problems. And, and if, um, if, 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 if you have, I, I've been told that the unemployment rate for youth of color is about 40%. And if we have a new minimum wage and you're an employer, and you're looking at two job applicants for one position and somebody's a UW graduate looking for a $15 an hour job and somebody is maybe a high school graduate or maybe not even that who has never had job interview skills, hasn't had a resume, doesn't have job experience and they're both applying for the same job. Um, which one are you gonna hire? It's gonna be very, very difficult. And so there, there will be consequences uh, about, uh, there will be some unintended consequences and as Dr. Pierce talks about, Compression, um, so it'll, it'll, that'll be a tough one to solve. But wouldn't it be the same now? I mean, right now you presented with two people like that with very different qualifications. You know, you would have the same choice. It's not, it's not the wage that makes the difference. It's the fact that one person's more qualified than the other. Well, I would argue that that maybe at UW graduates, I mean, maybe, I don't know, it's, I could regret what I'm about to say because somebody's going to come up to me and say, I just graduated and I'm working at McDonald's, but <laughs> hypothetically, um, I don't know that most recent college students would be applying for the same jobs, let me put it, for the same positions that are available, let me put it that way. So I'll just add to this point. We did look at some data on the impact on youth employment in particular from other cities, and we did not see looking at, there, there were two studies done, one at the University of California, the other the University of Colorado, looking at the 10-year time horizon, so a very robust study with a very large sample, 
the 10-year time horizon after the increase of a state or municipal minimum wage, those two studies did not find a change in youth unemployment. Now, youth tend to be more unemployed than people in the middle of their lives. Uh, so there, there's some other dynamics there, obviously, with people in school, new to the workforce, not a lot of experience, but that exist with regard, regardless of where the minimum wage is set. But the, the re, if there's some reassurance, I mean, I think the, the compression thing is no doubt real to a point, but again, it's not a doubling. It's a, a more uh, nuanced or, or sloped uh, upwards pressure. And then on the, on the youth thing, I, I was somewhat reassured by what the data had to tell us, that, it was, that there weren't long-term disruptions to youth employability. What kind of enforcement mechanisms do you think should be included? So I, this is my favorite topic that I'm diving in and learning a lot about. No, this is true. Because um, I think I'm the, maybe the only like enforcement geek on the IIAC. Everyone's, yeah. Uh, so here's my observation about in current enforcement. We have the nation's best uh, wage theft law here in Seattle and the nation's first municipal sick leave ordinance, neither of which has been enforced once. So the, you know, either this means every gas station, every residential construction contractor, every janitorial firm, every call center, and every fast food joint in the whole city is absolutely perfect, <laughs> and they don't do any of the wrong things that some of their peers around the country are sometimes caught doing, or it means we don't have a very good enforcement mechanism. Does everybody know about wage theft? What the definition of wage, wage theft is? Yeah. Great. So, so my view of this is that, you know, lawyers tend to write enforcement mechanisms that are good for lawyers, and bureaucrats write enforcement mechanisms that are good for bureaucrats. Um, and unfortunately, neither of those are particularly user-friendly for low-wage workers, some of whom have speak English as a second language, some of whom have only a high school education, many of whom work in isolated environments, janitorial industry, one person cleans 50,000 square foot a night, may not see their coworkers. Home care, a big one, um, wh where the wage and hour law abuses are most likely to occur. And so in order to have effective enforcement, I actually liken it to the nursing home industry, right? In Washington State, we have a great program called the Nursing Home Ombudsman Program. And the state uses a small amount of paid staff to train a large number of volunteers to actually go visit nursing homes and use their eyes and ears to see if there are things like unnecessary use of restraints, over medication, malnourishment, or bed sores, and in a way that's not, uh, it, it would not be solved most of the time through a complaint-based top-down system of enforcement. In, in California, the janitorial industry has a very interesting model where they tax themselves, not the government taxes them, they tax themselves one penny an hour for every hour worked by their employees and they put it into a, a not-for-profit organization uh, called, I think, the Maintenance Cooperative Trust Fund, I think is its name, MCTF, I know are the initials. Their website is janitorialwatch.org. And they hire former janitors to go and do worksite visits to educate current janitors about their rights on the job. And because it's not, a one, it's not just about city law, they, that organization can then, if a worker has a complaint that really belongs at the federal level, they can steer it to the federal level if it's an EEOC complaint. If it's, a, if it's an OSHA complaint, they can steer it there. Or if it's a state wage and hour law thing, they can steer it there. And so it's a much more user-friendly, bottom-up thing. It also happens to be highly efficient. And that M M MCTF has, in, has collected more in back pay in the janitorial industry than the entire city of San Francisco's official city office of labor standards has. So I tend to think these devolved, empowering, cooperative, not-for-profit models that actually give workers the, the tools to prevent most infractions from occurring to begin with have the most promise. Um, you know, the LNI system here in Washington is another example. Every worksite over 11 employees has a health and safety committee, or is supposed to. Uh, now, if you work in an office, it's you're often very safe environments, but if you're in maritime or industrial uh, construction, those health and safety committees really do matter. And they are essentially the eyes and ears on the worksite to prevent employee injuries or death. And so I, I personally think that if we're going to get to effective enforcement, it's not how big you make the fine or how intrusive you make the audit by a government agency. It's actually about can you give ordinary people the power to prevent most violations and then to recognize those that do occur and document them in a contemporaneous way. So that's my personal view of this. Anyone else? <laughs> 
Okay, here's another one. It's your thing. <laughs> oh, what are the two most thorny issues for your commission? <laughs> I, I mean, I think that's easy. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the question of, that someone raised before of whether or not to count wages only or other forms of compensation towards a wage credit is a very thorny issue where roughly equal numbers of people hold polar opposite viewpoints and a relatively small number of people are in the middle. Um, and that's one. And then I think th there is this whole question about phase-in and the concept of phase-in is not particularly controversial. But the question of how, how the details matter. Um, the mayor has said, for example, that he thinks if uh, the uh, if there's l less or nothing in the total compensation bucket, that maybe the phase needs to be longer, or vice versa. Uh, some people argue for, some people inside labor and business argue for one, uh, a, a unified approach that treats all businesses the same. And some people in labor and some people in business argue the opposite. And this is a divide that doesn't actually cut neatly across the business labor lines, where some types of businesses may want a slower phase in for small businesses, local businesses, or not for profits. Uh, one city council member has talked to me about a four-tier structure. Um, so I think that, the, the, and, they, and these two things are interdependent in some ways because the way one moves may impact negotiations on the other. That's, that's my view of it. I th actually think a lot of the rest is kind of we're at conceptual agreement on many of the other details. And there are a couple of, um, a couple of people have suggested uh, what, whom they consider to be the, 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 the bi largest violators of, of of a low minimum wage that we have now. And there, it's, all, it's all in the press, so I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but a lot of people are pretty judgmental about Walmart and, and um, McDonald's and places like that. So I'm not, making a I'm not making a judgment about that, but if you throw, if you penalize them and make them go straight $15 an hour now because of, based on their size, unfortunately that net, in my opinion, catches other employers that are large as well. And we're lucky to live here in the Puget Sound reason, re region with whom I consider to be progressive employers. And I think of REI, I think of uh, Costco, I think of Starbucks, um, and then maybe some of the retailers, uh, Nordstrom, people like that. So I don't think they're the big bad wolf. I don't think that they're taking advantage the way some of the more targeted large companies are. So if you said, if you just pick a number and said, okay, everybody who has sales of more than $2 billion a year has to go to 15 now. Well, you're, yeah, you're, catching, you're, you're capturing McDonald's and Walmart and, and some of the other big names, and I'm not making judgments about those companies, I'm just using them as examples, but you're also catching some of the other companies, and I don't think that they should be tarred uh, uh, with that. So that's a much lesser uh, discussion. We've just discussed that more infrequently than, than we have about what do you count for income and what phase in would be, but it's an interesting discussion. I guess I, I, I just want one comment is that a number of living wages have done that, have to have the different compensation, but not when they've been minimum wage covering everybody. And the one thought I had, and I don't know how it's been discussed in the committee, is that every time you start to make distinctions, then you have to define them. What is coverage, you know? What is, which benefits count? Which ones don't? And then you create lines and gaming. Uh, and it gets more, the more details, the more tiers, et cetera, the more complicated it gets. That doesn't, you know. So and you're, then argu you get you're arguing for simplicity? Simplicity, and I would, I would, I would trade off more phase in for more simplicity. Would you, right. Because if you're going to hit, you know, as you said, some of the companies that have been progressive right. and you don't want to do that, it's better, to, I think, to for everybody in the same, be in the same boat and not be trying to figure out how they can get, you know, around this or, and, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it, I understand your point and, and the, you know, the restaurant and hospitality industry, um, you know, some of the nicer, you know, fancier uh, restaurants in town, for example, if you were to include gratuities, um, you know, some of those uh, servers there, you know, they make, you know, $45, $50 an hour. So should they go to, s the question is, I'm not making a statement, I'm asking a question, should, the, should they go $15 or should 
that other form of income also be included? That's one of the debates that's going on, and it'll be interesting to see what the outcome is. Well, we've had the we've had the uh, state minimum wage without you know without this thing. Yeah, yes, we it. have absolutely, and it seems to work. Mm -hmm. Here's my own little question Great. that I've been thinking about: Am I going to lose my little? Vietnamese restaurant that's just a block away from me, and is it going to be replaced with a um, um, big mega restaurant? Why? Well, because it's a small business, and they probably do not pay fifteen dollars an hour. And maybe they, you know, it's expensive to have a restaurant downtown. It's a little hole in the wall. I just, um, I'm concerned that. Um, we're going to lose those little, those uh, cute little places downtown. I live downtown, mm -hmm. and I don't want to lose those cute little places. So, have you been discussing that, or just is there any concern, or is that no problem deemed no problem? Uh, no, it's not deemed no problem. There's a great deal of discussion about this. We talked about, uh, you know, whether there would be any exemptions or exclusions in the state minimum wage and uh, whether there would be exclusions for social services, whether there'd be exclusions for other not-for-profits, whether there'd be exclusions for union organizations and whether there would be exclusions for you know, immigrant businesses, women-owned businesses, family-owned businesses, as you describe. So we have three weeks remaining to <laughs> Oh, yeah. good. I'm to glad to know you're going to solve question. it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think this is why there's, there are constituencies for phasing things in, right? I mean, I've been to, I mean, if you sort of think about this, I don't know anything about running a restaurant. Um, my father-in-law owns some coffee shops for a while, but he's retired. Um, I know a lot about eating in restaurants, uh, actually. Um, I guess I eat in restaurants all the time. Um, I don't pack my lunch to work. I, look, I work downtown, so there's like 20 places I can walk to at lunch between, within five minutes. Um, many of them, the great little Vietnamese place that's upstairs and around the corner. Uh, here's my observation, is that when I, fly, when I fly to New York for work, I still manage to find great restaurants, despite the fact that real estate prices in the commercial core are something like five times higher than they are in Seattle. And uh, when I fly to Tokyo and go order a Starbucks and they make my quad grande Americano exactly the way that they make it in downtown Seattle, uh, despite the fact that I don't speak a word of Japanese, and those may be the only words of English that the <laughs> barista speaks, um, it doesn't cost me, I mean, it may cost a little bit more, but it not a lot more. Um, and when I fly to Sydney, where the minimum wage is $16, there does not appear to be a shortage of somewhat reasonably priced, I mean, a little bit more expensive, but not tremendously more expensive food. And so this is where the plural of anecdote is not data because the real world experience has been that the places that have significantly higher costs, whether those be wage costs, real estate costs, et cetera, d don't necessarily experience a, a dramatically higher rate of business closure. Now keep in mind, restaurants close all the time already. It's a highly chaotic business. You know, there's that stat about, you know, small business creates most jobs. Well, they also kill the most jobs because uh, most people are actually employed by large organizations. Uh, not small ones, because there's just this churn, and not every business idea works. But what the, what the data suggests in San Francisco when they did their minimum wage jump, which is the same thing as was, that happened here in 1989 when we eliminated the tip credit. So in a single day, tipped employee wages doubled in 1989 in Washington State. And there had been predictions of significant job loss and business closure that the data just didn't bear out. There was actually ra relatively rapid growth in restaurant employment in the period and immediately following that. And so there's the fear you had. I was just right before this, I was meeting with a restaurant owner about, guess what, this topic. And, um, and I think from his perspective, he talked a lot about planning and the ability to make a plan. Um, and that if you know something's coming and you know it's coming a certain, whether it's college tuition you're gonna have to pay for yourself or for a child, or uh, the, you know, the things that really kill us are the big, giant, unexpected costs, whether that's as a homeowner, a couple of winters ago, my basement flooded, guess who was not getting a summer vacation that year, right? Because uh, I was not anticipating a giant cost. Um, and so what this, this person made the point to me that if you, um, 
know a cost is coming sufficiently well in advance, you make other choices. There's some things that happen on price. There's some things that happen on your vendors, your suppliers. You adjust and make other strategies. And so I think that the idea of not surprising the small, those relatively undercapitalized small businesses has a lot of appeal on the committee. Um, but interestingly enough, no one has actually come forward and say, I'm the industry that I'd like to ask for a special exemption. And even some folks, like the human service providers and the not-for-profits, they actually came to us and said, we actually want the same rules to apply for us, to everybody else, but we need some time to make it work. Right. So to, to David's point and to your point about your favorite place up the street, as an employer, uh, representing, quote, the business community, we, I employ about 600 people. And what does business and what do I like the most? I like predictability and what do we hate the most is surprises. Mm -hmm. And so this discussion about how long it takes to get to the right goal is, is why I support that. And I, you know, as a business owner from Seattle, I'm really, really proud that we have this goal. And yes, there are people in the business community who are not supportive of it. But for the most part, and certainly on the committee, and um, certainly many people, many members, not all of them, many members of the chamber are supportive of this. And, and to get on my political soapbox for a minute, you know, I, I, I've traveled, been fortunate enough to travel to a great deal of places, and I am so proud to be a citizen of this country. And why am I proud of it? Because it has a great, broad middle class. And I don't wanna see <coughs> this middle class ripped asunder. And as the income inequality gap gets larger, I'm afraid that that's what we're going to see. And to, to spout one of the few st statistics that I know, because when I need statistics, I just lean next door to my right here. <laughs> but back in the 60s and 70s, 60% um, uh, of the median income would support uh, a modest house, a car payment, and a small family. In the Puget Sound region, 60% of the median wage, the median wage is 25.50 in Puget Sound. 60% of that is 15.29. And we have uh, the highest state minimum wage in the country, which is great, but it's 9.32. So if we want to go back to that quality of life for the middle class that, the, that Americans enjoyed in the 60s and 70s, to get to 60% of the median wage, we need to be at 1529, and we're talking about a goal of 15. And, and as a business owner, if I can plan for it, if I can predict it, if I can bake it into my budget, if I can do my headcount planning, if I can do my pricing, if I can tell my clients and my customers who are coming from out of town, coming from other places, what the costs are going to be when they're planning their family vacations, because that's my bread and butter, then I'm happy to do that. And that's why, to David's point, that the committee is, is mostly for a phase in. So. I have a question for the, these guys. <laughs> Has anybody talked about indexing once you get to 15? Oh, yeah, we're talking about a CPI uh, inclusion. Right. Uh, 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 consumer price index, uh, cost of inflation, and in this country, it's about 2% a year. Right now. I mean, right now. Yeah, it varies. <laughs> Back in the Carter days, it was 21%, so. <laughs> yes. You may have already answered this, but uh, if the data shows that business and the citizens and the cities who have raised the minimum wage were not hurt, then why not raise it immediately? Um, I, I'd be, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to ask yeah. the, the person who asked the question, did the discussion of phase in answer your, your question? Because I think that's what your question is, immediately versus a phase in. And we've, we've talked a little bit tonight about phase in. And a uh, lady here, I don't think got a chance to write down a question, but with the cannula. No? no. <laughs> yeah, you want to? Well, the, the Washington state law on minimum wage ties the, our annual minimum wage to the CPIW, 
see, which is the labor, which is the market basket of goods and services that the Labor Department uses to calculate increases in the cost of living for employed individuals um, in, a, in, a, in a geography. So in this case, it would be the Seattle, Bellevue, Everett, Metropolitan Statistical Area. Um, the, the, now, the, what the thing like the self-sufficiency standard clearly may, makes clear is that, that a typical market basket and a market basket for low-wage workers are actually different. Because if, my, if iPhones get cheaper and eggs get more expensive, they could easily cancel each other out, but for but an iPhone, despite how much I love mine, is really a luxury, and I could get by with a cheap old flip phone and, and, and pay, you know, get the phone for free, pay very little for monthly service as a, as a necessity. Um, but, uh, but eggs or milk or bread or gasoline or housing and childcare and a number of other things uh, are inflating at a faster rate than the luxury items that uh, travel, electronics, whatever, that go into a market basket for a typical family. So you do have an underlying c structural problem with the CPA, CPI when you apply it to any extreme of an income group. That's true on the, uh, that's true, you, you wouldn't use the CPA to calculate, since there are no Arabian horses in the CPI market, market basket, what it means for the top 1% is largely irrelevant. Um, and since there are, too many iPhones and not enough eggs and bread and milk as a percentage of the whole, you, you do tend to have some skewing at it. Uh, you would probably know if this is a solvable problem in some way. I, I generally think of influencing the policies of the U.S. Department of Labor as a little bit beyond the scope of our committee. <laughs> at this point, indexing is so much better than not. <laughs> that, um, eventually, you have to correct it. And we're actually talking at the state level about jumping the, the minimum wage at the state level just because over enough time, a couple decades, we'll have to revisit it. But for the time being, that that's better than nothing, which is what most people are doing. Yeah. Um, here's a question that no one has to really answer, but I will <laughs> answer, uh, I will direct the person. Uh, who are the other members of the committee? There are like about 24 members of the committee, and if you get on, go online, and uh, what would they, uh, would they just go to the, the city council, the mayor, go to the mayors and go under the income inequality committee? And you'll find you'll find the names. So I'll tell you what I'll give you the website tonight before we finish. Just oh, give me a minute okay. to look it up, and then okay. everything that we're doing, our committee schedules, our subcommittee schedules, all of the members and contact information are all on the website. Okay, great. We'll announce that before we close. How does the minimum wage law impact workers who work on commission? For example, store clerks, salespeople, car sales, electronic sales, etc. He's looking uh, so commit for employees who work uh, on commissions they are included in the state minimum wage law um, now so if you were at Macy's and your base pay you, know, you get a commission your base pay might be 932 but it's not going to be five dollars um, you, you the minimum wage law does apply and your commissions come in over that and as we talked about earlier the question of what if anything is going to be different from the city minimum wage law than the state is still a subject of deep uh, and uh, sometimes difficult consideration on the committee. And I am assuming that's a little bit uh, similar to the next question, how should tips be handled? Yeah, the same, would be the same answer. Today's Wall Street Journal had an article about the growing shortage of rental housing units resulting in increasing rental costs nationwide. If rental costs represent 30% of income budgeted, what is the impact of this and other escalating costs on future adjustments to the minimum wage? <laughs> and <laughs> indexing. <laughs> if, if the minimum wage was tied to the cost of rental housing, then obviously it would do it, but I wouldn't suggest tying it to any any one particular cost. I would build in something that would say every so many years, 
there should be a reexamination of what the what the base should be, mm -hmm. um, so that you could you could jump it and wouldn't have to wait until you need to jump it a big m jump like now. Um, I would just say like every five years or something, just have a commission that says, is, are we are we keeping up with with the costs that are facing people at the minimum wage, which is you know the self sufficiency standard, and that would kind of get at some of those issues. Are small businesses getting adequate consideration in the process? Kind of discuss that. Uh, well, small businesses are represented on the committee, and everyone is contributing both their points of view and their neighbors and constituents' points of view. Um, it's like what we talked about. You know, when I, I talked about the other extreme of that is the Almost. targeting the large businesses. Is, and as Dr. Pierce said, how do you define small business? Is it defined by revenue? Is it defined by number of employees? Is it 10 or fewer, five or fewer, family members? Or if you go to the revenue number, is it you know a million dollar a year company, million dollars a year to some small businesses is a lot. I would imagine that's a lot to the Vietnamese restaurant we were referencing earlier, but maybe to a five store uh, locally owned coffee chain, maybe a million dollars a year isn't that big. So there's, it's, it's also a definition question. Yes, it is actively discussed, and there are small business owners on the IIAC. Okay, um, well this is not directly under your purview, but has the city implemented the $15 wage minimum, and what was the cost? Well, has any city, that's what I'm getting. Oh, has any city? implemented a $15 wage minimum and so what no one's no one's implemented $15 San Francisco has something like $11 plus a $2 health care spend requirement so it, it comes out to about $13 in mandated for hourly costs for hourly wage earners in San Francisco the experience was that um, the the employment actually grew relative to the surrounding communities in San Francisco uh, when that happened and um, the um, and during the next re during the following recession, which I think was the 2001 to 2002 recession, okay. employment shrank more slowly in San Francisco than during the surrounding communities. Um, it, you know, so we can find some other examples. I mentioned a couple of them. You know, Washington State doubled its tip wages on tipped workers in 1989. Employment actually went up uh, in restaurants and bars. Uh, there was a similar experience in Santa Fe, which had a, again, an increase not to 15, but about the same percentage size as we're considering here, about 65% over the state minimum. And then we're watching in real life what happens in SeaTac. Um, now, SeaTac was not a minimum wage law. It was what's called a living wage law that applied only to businesses of a certain size and a certain category. Uh, and most of it is suspended in court waiting for an argument on June 26th before the Washington State Supreme Court for the businesses that operate on the airport itself. For businesses outside of the airport, um, you know, we're getting to see in real time what's happening. We know of one hotel that closed its restaurant, uh, about 10, it was a very small restaurant that served just hotel patrons, lo about 10 jobs. We know that a rental car, or not a rental car, a parking lot that predicted it would go to all automation now has giant big signs up, we're hiring at $15 an hour. Um, <laughs> So you know, that's anecdote, and it's not yet data. So I don't want to, I want to, you know, uh, but the data from the cities that have done this is actually suggests that, you know, as a San Francisco County supervisor came and told us last week at the symposium, it's not that big of a deal. Um, Yeah, yeah, that's what it was about, city employees. Yeah, I know. Uh, so because most of the city employees are re union represented, uh, unless there's a state, unless there's a city, under state, under state public sector bargaining laws, public sector bargaining laws are the only way to negotiate increases in pay or benefits or decreases or whatever with a publicly, so public sector or union represented workforce. And there's something like 17 unions that represent different groups of workers in the city. Uh, I can't imagine. Well, I'll get it myself into trouble if I open my mouth on that uh, part of it. But it's in, they're in the process of negotiating it and implementing it. 
right now. They're mostly parked short ones. Yeah, and, and by the way, it's not a ton of people. Um, yeah, it's yeah. Not very right, it's, there are very few relatives, as a percentage, very few city employees. I think no county employees, you know. Uh, I think the Seattle Times reported there were 800. Yeah. It was going to cost about, about a million dollars or something like that to do it. Um, did you have something more to say, Howard? Lest you think I was texting while driving or texting while I was up here not paying attention, I really was. I was desperate to get the website, which I should know off the top of my head. <laughs> um, the website for the IIAC is as follows, www.seattle.gov, G-O-V, slash income inequality. So www.seattle.gov slash forward, forward. Okay, so it's www.seattle.gov forward slash income inequality. We're All one word, no spaces. We're ending, uh, it's a little bit after nine. We promise to, to wind it up at nine. We will put links to the websites and materials referenced in the program tonight on the league website. So if you didn't get uh, Howard's, uh, the correct backslash or whatever, you can see it on the league website. And I think we have, Diana, we have your uh, on our computer, yeah. so we will put That's those things that were in purple that we couldn't read there, those um, references will be on our website. So thank you all for coming.